Anyway, we want to open up our Bible study tonight with a word of prayer as we always do. I invite you to bow your heads with me a moment. King Jesus, Master of the Universe, Savior of lost mankind, we love you today, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to delve into the Word of God. There is no richer, more beautiful document that ever has been penned than the sacred text of God's holy word. We ask tonight, oh God, that you would loose the anointing and the presence of God upon the teacher as well as upon those who are hearing and listening to the teaching. Allow us, Lord, to have open minds and open hearts to receive truth Master, in the name of Jesus, you've declared in your word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And Lord, tonight, I believe there is information and knowledge to be gleaned that will liberate those who have been captive to false teaching and false ideology and false theology, those who have been pushed away and alienated from the church by wrong teaching. Master, in the name of Jesus, do a reconciling work tonight. Master, today, save to the uttermost those that are lost, reclaim the backslider, touch those sick in body, filled with the Holy Ghost, deliver from oppression, Master, in the name of Jesus. We ask all this tonight in that precious, sacred name, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. We have been engaged now for several weeks in a Bible study that I simply titled LGBT Affirming Theology. I'm going to do a real quick brief overlap, so to speak, from last week uh, because this point, I think, makes for a good jumping off point for our Bible study this evening. I mentioned last week that there are two very important theological truths in the Word of God. And uh, if these truths stand, as all truth stands, of course, then there is a conclusion that we must draw that, sadly, most evangelical and fundamentalist churches absolutely do not draw However, it is an important truth. The Word of God states in 1 John 3 and verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if sin is the transgression of the law, we have a very simple definition for sin, and that is transgression of the law, period, okay? Now, if sin is a transgression of the law, and if what the Lord's brother James wrote to us in James chapter 2, verse 10, is also true, and we know it is because the biblical test is um, in the presence of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And we know the Apostle Paul mirrored this same identical uh, truth as well in other places. But James writes, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. One of the most frustrating things that I go through as a progressive pastor, as an LGBT affirming pastor, I get these people who love to write me or, or say to me in person, you know, uh, well, 
you're you're teaching false. You're not telling these people that homosexuality is sin. Oh, am I am I in the wrong because I'm not like you trying to identify and and label everything that is sin? Um, first of all. You are a hypocrite that deserves to have your rear end kicked. And I mean kicked hard. You don't, you're not interested in defining sin. Because if you were interested in defining sin, you would have to go through the entirety of the law and identify every single point of the law as being sin. Now, that's not what you're interested in doing. You're interested simply in labeling something or someone sin or a sinner so that you can be self-satisfied in your condemnation and in your judgment and in your criticism. The reality is, if sin is transgression of the law. Now, uh, fundamentalists and evangelicals, I said it before, if it weren't for hypocrisy, there'd be no fundamentalism. It couldn't live. It can't survive without hypocrisy. Okay. There are so many inconvenient truths that slap these people right in the face that they just don't want to face, they just don't want to deal with. If sin is defined as transgression of the law, then eating shrimp or eating lobster is a sin. Now, they'll stand there and they'll try, movie. they'll try to divide the law up and say, well, no, there's, there's ritual law and there's religious law and blah, blah, blah. And yet, talk to any Jew and ask them if those divisions exist, and they'll laugh you right out of the room. We're going to talk about it in a moment tonight. We're going to be looking at some biblical passages and some stories uh, where Daniel, for instance, risked his life in order to not transgress the dietary law uh, of the Jewish faith. He risked his life so as not to transgress the dietary, one of the dietary laws. Why did he do this? Because the dietary laws are on the same exact level as any other law. To transgress one point of the law is the same as having transgressed them all. So therefore, going out of your way to try to identify certain things as sin, I'm going to say it plain tonight, is sheer jackassery. It is the stupidest thing you can do. What separates the sinner, what separates the unsaved from the saved, the regenerate, the born again, is faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Period. Now, will our, is our conduct affected by that faith? Absolutely. Will our conduct, uh, as we grow in the Lord and as we mature, will we, in effect, uh, find ourselves living in closer keeping, Not certainly not in perfect? keeping with the law of Moses, but will there be things in our life that will change? Yes. And as I've said before, and I'll say it a thousand times before I die, um, if God don't change it, it didn't need to be changed. If it were 
so important that it would keep you out of heaven, God would change it. But fundamentalism leaps off of a cliff with one major false premise. And that is that a believer doesn't sin, that we're supposed to live above sin. Well, wait a minute, folks. If sin is the transgression of the law, then to live above sin, again, that means that a married man would not put uh, scissors to his beard. That means that you would leave the locks at the temple long, as the law teaches. That means that... Um, you would eat certain foods and you would not eat other foods. All of these things would be true if we're in fact supposed to be living sinless, okay? So there are things by reason of the law that we do every single day that are in contradiction to the law. But as a believer, we are not delivered by faith in Jesus Christ from the effects or the influence of the law or of, of sin, but rather we are delivered according to the word of God from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God, you don't earn it, you don't live good enough or live perfect enough in order to secure it. No, it is a gift. The gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've talked about last week, we talked about the, the one, uh, uh, one major truth. Again, the fundamental. I talk about this, folks, because I grew up in fundamentalism, and I know that there are thousands of people out there who are going to watch this video, if not soon later. And you've been down this road. You grew up fundamentalist, or you're coming out of a fundamentalist church. You've probably given up on God entirely and quit. Don't want anything to do with the church anymore because of the wrong teaching and the wrong doctrine that comes out of fundamentalism, okay? So there's a reason why I kind of jump on them the way I do. Um, there are so many people who, who have been so damaged, and, and the number one organization within the fundamentalist movement that has devastated millions of people over the course of, you know, hundreds of years is the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC. They are the most foul, false doctrine, false teaching pile of manure that ever hit the church world, just saying it plainly. And then, of course, you've got your Pentecostal Trinitarian denominations uh, that identify as fundamentalists. By the way, the Apostolic Church does not identify, nor can it identify, as fundamentalist, because there are major points of uh, conflict between fundamentalism and the apostolic faith. So the apostolic church, legalistic in its own right, is not fundamentalist, okay? It is not a fundamentalist. It is a literalistic, legalistic movement, but it is not fundamentalist, okay? So anyway, so it's important to understand uh, people say, you know, what well, do you do you teach that homosexuality is a sin? And I always answer the same exact way. What difference does it make? What, what difference does it make if I teach homosexuality is a sin or not? Or if I teach drunkenness is a sin or not? Or if I teach drug use is a sin or not? What difference does it make? The gospel is not about you have to stop doing certain behaviors. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel 
is according to the Lord Jesus Christ, who spent three and a half years saying, believe on me, believe on me, believe on me, believe on me. He never told anybody, quit doing anything. Told the woman at the well, he said, hey, you've spoken well. You've had five husbands. The man you're with now, you're not married to. Did you ever hear him say, now you need to move out because you're not married to that man. So you need to move out from him. No, he didn't have one single word with her concerning her living situation and how in order to make herself right with God, she needed to change her situation. woman came in who's known to be a harlot and washes the Lord's feet and anoints his feet and wipes them with her hair. And the scribes and Pharisees condemn him, of course, because he allows this sinner to come in and do this. Yeah, Lord. Where was all your condemnation for her harlotry? Where was, all, where was your condemnation for her conduct? Everybody never said a word about it. Because the issue is not behavior. The issue is faith. Do you believe and have you obeyed? I say those two things together because you cannot believe without obedience. There, there's no such thing as believing anything if you don't obey it as well. So the, the, uh, the New Testament plan of salvation requires faith, and then it requires action because the Lord's brother, James, in James chapter 2 says, faith without works, action. That's all he means. The term he uses, works. He's not talking about the works of the law. He's not talking about arbitrary you know, works out of, the blue, out of the clear blue sky. He is saying, faith without action is dead being alone. That is why the gospel teaches, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. When uh, Peter preached to the house of Cornelius, and the Spirit of the Lord fell, as I preached this past Sunday, upon the house of Cornelius, after they received the Holy Ghost, the next words of Peter's lips was, Where is water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So faith in the gospel has to be followed by a specific prescribed response to the gospel. You see, how do we take a spiritual principle? How do we take a spiritual... Uh, I'm trying to think of the best word to use here. How do we take something that is spiritual and apply it to our lives uh, in, a, in a real way. And the Word of God teaches very simply, it's a very simple thing. The act of the ordinance of water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is God's prescribed response to the gospel. Thus, we are demonstrating through action that we believe this message. We believe, according to the Apostle Peter, that there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. So we believe that salvation is found in the name of Jesus, and that is why we baptize in the name of Jesus, because that is where salvation is found, in his name. Okay, so what difference does it make how you, I, how you define and what you define as sin? 
Well, because, bless God, we're supposed to get the church to act right. We're supposed to get Christians to act right. Well, wait a minute. Now, now y'all are contradicting your own message. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Then say he had to make himself into a new creature. My Bible said, as many as believed on him, gave he the power to become the sons of God, even as many as believe on his name. According to my Bible, God gives the power to become the sons of God. Of course, according to my Bible, I also understand it doth, that now we are the sons of God, and yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be. For when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So, yeah, we're saved. Yeah, we're born again. Yes, we've become part of the family of God. But still, we don't look like we're going to look. We don't become what we're going to become. No, we're still in a human body. We're still subject to sin. We still are going to have weaknesses. We're going to have failings. We are going to have issues in our lives over which we have absolutely no control. But according to First Baptist or according to First Assembly of God, bless God, you better get them things under control or you're going to miss the rapture. Liars. Where then is grace? What role does grace play in your doctrine? I'll tell you what role it plays. It plays a deceitful role, according to these fundamentalist organizations. God speaks of grace, but he's actually deceiving you. Because grace is only there to get you to the altar. It's only there to get you to pray, according to Baptist, the prayer of faith, that brings salvation a lie. It's not, it's not a biblical doctrine. You cannot point to one scripture, not one time in the word of God is there a passage that says, to be saved, you must pray uh, the sinner's prayer. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. That is a concoction of men. But that's what they teach. And that... That's all grace is there for, to get you to that altar to pray the sinner's prayer. Hallelujah. And then it disappears. Because now everything you do wrong, every misdeed, every misword, every action, every weakness, every fault, every failing is going to keep you out of heaven. And it's now on you. To earn heaven. Oh, they hate when I say that. No, we don't believe you got to earn heaven. Well, what do you call it then? Come on. Let's be intellectually honest here. Let's quit being stupid and playing games. That's exactly what you're teaching. That people have to earn heaven. The homosexual has to earn heaven by somehow overcoming his or her sexual orientation. That's what you're teaching. Admit it. Be honest. Okay? So, the bottom line is this. Every believer is a sinner saved by grace. Every believer, there's not a one. The Apostle Paul was talking to the Romans about the law. When he said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Read it in context. He was not talking about unbelievers. He was not talking about uh, the world, so to speak. No, he was talking about the law and the role the law plays or doesn't play in the New Testament believer's life. And he points to the fact, honey, by reason of the law, they know one of us, not a one of us, I don't care how high your hair is, 
lady. I don't care how short your hair is, man. I don't care how long your dresses are or whether you wear closed-toed shoes or whether you wear stockings or not. There is not a one of us that is not condemned a thousand times over by reason of the law. Because like I said, sin is the transgression of the law. And if you transgress the law, whether it be eating shrimp or whether it be uh, committing adultery, it's all the same. The Apostle Paul say, you know, if you don't murder but you commit adultery, then it's as if you've done it all. So the answer to sin is faith and obedience to the gospel. God's answer to sin was a life raft. The world is sinking. It is the Titanic. The world is sinking. It's going under. One day, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sink, as it were. But God has given us a life raft. He has offered us a life raft by grace. All we have to do is receive it through faith. We get on the life raft. He's going to come, and he's going to get us. When he comes to get us, he'll clean us up. He'll fix us up. He'll make us what we ought to have been, what we should have been before Adam's loss, before Adam disobeyed God. But until then, the Apostle Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What do people think he's talking about? What, you know, how stupid can people be? I mean, come on, people. Wake up. How foolish can you be? The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men in the faith to ever grace this planet. And yet Paul said, not as though I had already attained or were already made perfect. No, he acknowledged. He said, baby, I haven't got there. I'm not there. I'm nowhere near there. Said, oh, wretched man that I am, that I am, that I am in the present. He wasn't talking, oh, wretched man that I was before I was converted. It's not what he said. Said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he goes on to say, the sting of death is sin. Right? Or, or you know, uh, and of course that the, uh, and the sting of sin, I should say, is death. <sighs> My Lord. Folks, we can sit here and try to define certain things as being sin or not. Now, our position is very simple. I do not believe that the homosexual orientation or the transgender transsexual um, condition is a uh, violation of the law in and of itself. I don't believe that for one minute because we've been looking at some of these passages and we understand that the law is specific, very specific. You know, God didn't just say, uh, thou shalt not um, have, you know, intimacy with family members and leave it broadly, you know, open-ended. That No, no. He literally went one by one by one and defined exactly who he meant. When he was talking about incest, he said, you don't, not with your father's daughter, not with your father's son, not with your mother's son, not with, you know what I'm saying? And if your father's wife's daughter, or your father, you know, I mean, he literally point by point went one by one. The law is immensely specific. And to say that God in the law 
condemned wholesale homosexuality is about as idiotic a statement as any person could ever make. And believe me, when you study Jewish scholars, you'll find out that they certainly don't buy into that crap of love. Say, no, no, that is, that is such a, that is such a violation of the law. You are twisting and perverting the law. You are twisting it so out of context to try to make it apply to this whole segment of a population. There was one, one, one specific sexual act. Women were not mentioned in the law whatsoever. There was one specific sexual act conducted between men. However, when you look into the context and you look at the scriptures more carefully, you understand that uh, this act is defined as being an act that is committed within the uh, framework of idolatrous religion. So it is a sexual act that has a direct connection to idolatry. So it's not even just a matter of a same-gender male-on-male act. Nowhere in the law does God address homosexuality, same-sex attraction, same-sex coupling as an orientation or as a, uh, a quote-unquote behavior. Now, one act he referred to, and he referred to that specific act because at the time the children of Israel were going into the promised land, that practice was common. And he said, I don't want you to behave as these people do. Okay. All right. So now there's a bit of an overlap, kind of a quick bringing you up to date. There are many subjects that the scriptures don't touch on. It's not a matter of they condemn it or they condone it. They just don't talk about it. And in reality, the LGBT, the gay orientation, or the transgendered issue simply is not specifically addressed in Scripture. Now, these things were known in the ancient world, but of course, in the ancient world, they also had a very different mindset and a very different way of looking at it. You know, uh, we've got fundamentalists who love to, oh, forget about history. We don't want to study history because then we find out some stuff that turns our beliefs on its ear. We don't want to understand context. No, no. It's all about the black and white. It's all about the black and white in the book. You can't understand the black and white in the book if you don't understand the history and the context. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, in the ancient world, oh, I'm going to turn some people on their ear tonight. Premarital sex was not viewed in Victorian era fashion as it is today. No, I'm sorry, I hate to tell you it wasn't. Was marrying a virgin uh, the ideal? Yep. And I want to tell you something else. It was the ideal for the girl. You, you'll always see that virginity was presented as a valuable prize, as it were, on the part of the girl, you never had it presented the same way on the part of the guy. Even within the context of the Old Testament law, the Lord said he'd rather a man uh, put it, place his seed into a whore than spill it upon the ground. Oh, but, you know, we, we, 
we've got everything in black and white terms. You know, we define everything today as black and white. Everything's black and white. We preach people into a state of sheer panic and horror and terror because the slightest transgression is going to cost them their soul. No, no, no. Grace, grace works. And grace is real. Now, I'm not saying that we ought to run out there and just do anything and everything we want to do in an effort to uh, take advantage of grace, as it were, because uh, that is uh, a very foolish <laughs> mindset, and we know that the Word of God warns us not to do this, okay, not to approach things, you know. Well, you know, if God's grace is there, then why do I even need to go to church? Why do I even need to try to be a Christian? Why do I even, you know, need to worry about believing the gospel or learning about the Lord if grace is going to take up the slack? Uh, grace takes up the slack, absolutely. But there is a responsibility on our part to come to know the Lord and grow in our walk with Him and in our relationship with Him. And we enter into a state of perfecting, not a state of perfection, but we enter into a state of perfecting on a scale of 1 to 100 from the moment we're converted until the rapture or until we die we may get up to five, or we may get up to seven. But the truth of the matter is, we are at least in pursuit. And this is where the Word of God says, follow peace with all men and holiness. People love to, uh, I, I was in the holiness movement, people love to pull this out of context, you know. Oh, you've got to have holiness. Hallelujah. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Honey, you'll never have holiness until you see the Lord. Word of God said, we shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. Guess what? Our being like him is tied to our seeing him. So you're not going to be like him in order to see him. No. <laughs> no. You're going to be like him when you see him. Okay? But we are to follow peace and holiness. That's what that passage is literally saying. Saying follow peace with all men and holiness. Follow. Pursue. Be in pursuit of these things. Okay? I want to live a godly life. I want to live the best life I can live in this life. Why? Because I'm grateful for salvation. When you get the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Holy Spirit of God is within you, guess what it does? Guess what God's Spirit in your life does? It makes you hunger and long for holiness makes you want to be more like him. Not, it doesn't make you legalistic. It doesn't make you, you, you know, uh, all of a sudden just, ah, I got I to gotta do everything right. No, no, no. But it most certainly helps to lead us and guide us in a good path and in a right path, in a path that is the best testimony to an unsaved world, in a path that is the most beneficial to us in our living. Because as I've said, when you understand the Word of God, when you understand this thing the way you're supposed to understand it, you understand that in the Old Testament there were books of law, which the law is fulfilled in Christ. So that helps us to identify what in God's eyes is viewed as sin. But then you have the books of wisdom. The books of wisdom were not law. So if you read something in the book of wisdom and it says, you know, my son, don't do this or do that, that is not a heaven or hell issue. He is not saying, oh, if you do this, you're going to hell. Oh, but first church of God will tell you that. They'll read something out of the Psalms. They'll read something out of Proverbs. Literally, 
And then they'll stand there and try to tell you that this is a, a, a binding rule in the New Testament, no less. That believers have to obey this. They have to do this because the Word of God says every word in the Word of God is law. No, it isn't. ding a -ling. No, it isn't. You have the books of law. You have the books of wisdom. You have the prophets. The prophets and the law according to Jesus and the Psalms all pointed us to him. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they that testify of me. So according to Jesus, if you search the law, if you search the, the Psalms, if you search the prophets, and he actually, in one place, he actually breaks it down and refers to all three of those. He says in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, he speaks of those three things. And by the way, folks, if, if every once in a while it looks like I kind of am almost fighting back a belch or something, my medication causes me very severe uh, indigestion and stomach upset sometimes. And uh, I, you know, you may see me kind of look. And the reason I'm mentioning it, I don't want some nut out there because I'm sure as I'm alive, somebody's going to do it. Some fundamentalist or evangelical is going to try to uh, suggest that uh, he's drunk. You know, he's been drinking. You know, look at him. He said, you know, no, that's not the case. You take a chemo drug like I take and see how well you tolerate it, okay? Uh, it doesn't happen every time, but unfortunately, Especially when I'm sitting up in the position I'm sitting right now, um, I kind of have to wrestle with it sometimes. So if you happen to see that, just understand I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that, okay? But anyway, all right. I want to talk tonight for a while. I doubt I'm going to be able to get through this thing because I took a good amount of time on a recap here. I actually want to talk about the biblical case for same-sex relationships. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 through 17, we read from the King James text, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. Both of her sons had died, so now she has two daughters-in-law living with her. Uh, they are not blood relatives. They have no obligation to her whatsoever. And she's saying, go ahead back to your families. Go back to your homes. She said, the Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. So she's saying, you know, I hope y'all are able to remarry and establish new lives, okay? Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? So she said, you know, y'all are young. You, you, you're able to go out and find new husbands and, you know, and, and pick up your life. She said, I'm too old to have any more kids. So it's not like I'm going to be bearing any boys for you to marry, you know. <clears throat> She said, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? So she said, if I got married tonight, and conceived tonight. You know, you're not going to sit around and wait for 
my boys to grow up, you know, for you to marry. And uh, you see the importance. Now take this into consideration. Think about it. You see how important at this time in history the notion of having a man was. Your whole life could be made or, or broken on whether or not you had a husband. You could live in poverty the whole rest of your life simply by not having a husband. So Naomi's saying, hey, you know, y'all, please go, go back to your families. You, you're young enough. You can find husbands. You can pick up your lives and start over again. You know, you're certainly not. I don't have any more sons. I'm not likely to have any more sons. Even if I could have more sons, it's, it's not going to happen, you know. So she goes into this whole diatribe, as it were. And then, she, and then the word of God said, Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So one of the daughters-in-law left. She gave her mother-in-law a kiss, and she departed. But Ruth held on to Naomi. And she said, Behold, this is Naomi still speaking to Ruth now. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, listen to these words. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. I literally use Ruth's words to Naomi in same gender uh, wedding ceremonies. I use those exact words. I have the couple repeat those words. That's their vow. Folks, there's no way in the universe you cannot see that qualifies as a beautifully worded wedding vow. Okay? She says, like, I'm going to repeat it again. Ruth said to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee. Don't ask me to go away or to return from following after thee. Don't ask me to stop following you and going with you. For whither thou goest, wherever you go, I will go. And where thou lodgest, wherever you stay, wherever you live, that's where I'm going to stay, that's where I'm going to live. I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Your family's my family. Your nation's my nation. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. Then she finishes off with, The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. In other words, till death do us part. Now, immediately, somebody's going to find fault with my using this story. And they're going to say, well, but there was no sex involved. Well, I got news for you. I don't know if there's sex involved in any couple that I have ever performed a wedding ceremony for. 
I've never stood in any one of their bedrooms. I've never stood there and observed whether or not they engaged in anything intimate or not. Well, but you know they're going to, in theory, in theory. But for people who are so hung up on the law, for people who are so concerned about quote-unquote sin, which is the transgression of the law, how is it that God's prescribed uh, mandates concerning the application of the law you happily ignore. See, according to God's law, the only way that anyone could ever even have charges brought against them for uh, breaking any of the laws, there had to be two independent, separate eyewitnesses to the actual event. Even a full admission was not admissible. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, God said, shall every word be established. So, in order for any charges to ever be brought against anyone, there had to be two literally independent, they, they could not be uh, uh, people in cahoots with one another had to be independent, separate people. And they had to witness the same thing at the same time. That's, that's not my suggestion, folks. That is the Word of God. That is the law. God didn't just give laws. He also defined how those laws were to be applied and how those laws were to be administered. That was part of the law. But we've got these people running around who they just want the rules, but they don't want to follow. You know, be like, for instance, we have laws in this country uh, against, uh, let's say, murder. But we also have laws in this country dealing with um, uh, the application of the law. You have your rights, you have your civil rights. So therefore, you, in order to be convicted, you have to go through and you have to have a due process. Am I right? If some cop drags you to jail and throws you in jail for that crime and doesn't read you your rights, guess what? You can get out on a technicality. Why? Because your civil rights were violated. If your rights were read to you in a language that you don't understand, your civil rights were violated. You've got to be given the opportunity to go to court you're given the opportunity of a bench trial in front of a judge or a, a jury trial. Am I telling the truth? Okay. If somebody, if you murder somebody and another person happens to watch you do this and sees you do this and walks up and blows your brains out and says, well, I'm just applying the law because there's a law against murder. And murderers get the death penalty. Guess what's going to happen to that guy? He's going to wind up in jail for the rest of his life and potentially wind up experiencing the very penalty that he imposed upon you. Because there's laws, and then there are laws which regulate how the law is to be applied. 
The same is true of God's law. So you cannot take the rules and ignore the, the rules concerning the application and administration of those rules or of those laws, okay? So having said that, you cannot look at any couple, straight or gay, and assume anything about what intimacies they may or may not engage in. It's none of your business, number one. The Word of God said it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done in secret. We are today a sex-obsessed society, and the church is every bit as much sex-obsessed as anybody is, in a slightly different way, perhaps. But man, the church is as hung up on all things sexual as it could ever be. I told you before, go back a couple hundred years, and that's as far back as you have to go. And the rule was, what people do in private is their own business. I don't want to know nothing about it. It's none of my business. I'm not touching it. As long as they're not bothering me, I'm not bothered by them. I know this from my own great-grandmother. You know, I told you the story before. My great-grandmother uh, was talking, or my grandmother one day was talking to me about how, in my day, we didn't have homosexuals running around. And, blah, blah, blah. and my great-grandmother, her mother, said, Oh, Eleanor, for crying out loud, what are you talking about? You knew those two men down the street from us at Falmouth? Because she grew up on Cape Cod, Falmouth, Massachusetts. And my grandma, well, they were, they were just roommates or whatever. My grandma would cancel. Oh, for Pete's sakes, I want her. Give me a break. What about those two women? Remember them that lived over here in this house? They were together for years and years. They were sisters, my grandmother said. My great grandma said, sisters, my eyeball. She said, we all knew what they were. Everybody knew the truth. We all knew that they were couples. She said, but back then, we followed a very simple rule. You know what? If you're not out in the middle of Main Street doing something, we could care less. We're going to treat you well. We're going to treat you kindly because... You hadn't done anything to hurt me. You hadn't done anything to offend me. You hadn't done anything that affects me in any way in the world. So while people today want to act like the church was obsessed with all things sexual in the first century as it is today, you are so far off base. It's not even funny. They try to act like the Jews, the ancient Jews, were as sex obsessed as we are. No, they were not. Now, there were certain things that were very much um, uh, against their religion. And those things were specifically stated in the law. Adultery. Fornication is defined as um, um, having sex with family members, rape, incest, rape, incest, prostitution, bestiality, molestation. Any sexual act that visited harm or injury or caused pain upon another person or even an animal was contrary to God's law. Now, I mentioned a couple weeks back, and boy, the video I sent this in got all kinds of views. People watched it. I mentioned a couple weeks ago uh, the idea that the entirety of the law is summed up in not visiting harm or injury upon another person. That, that is the entirety of the law in a nutshell. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said that when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. He said, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
said, Upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. And when I dared to suggest that LGBT relationships and what goes on in private, how is it that that cannot meet the standard of not visiting ill or, or you know, not harming another person? How does that not meet that requirement. Now obviously if the if one of the people involved is committing adultery, it's still adultery. I'm gonna tell you right now. Okay, I'm not saying it isn't. If they're committing incest, it's still incest. If they're committing rape, it's still rape. But what people do in the privacy of their own lives Got news for you, folks. It meets the biblical standard so long as you're not visiting harm or injury upon another person. Oh, but you're not supposed to say that because, bless God, that's not our position. I couldn't give a happy fig what your position is. Your position has caused nothing but grief and woe for people for eons. You've brought more condemnation and grief. More people have committed suicide over your position. Romans 13, 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul said, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, now listen, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now listen, verse 10, Romans 13. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Am I saying that indiscriminate um, sexual activity is good? that it's moral, that it's, uh, you know, uh, anything that God approves of. No, I'm not saying that. The Word of God talks about whoredom. The Word of God talks, that's, from, that's a word that's applied to females, okay, whoredom, all right? Meaning um, sexually active outside of marriage, okay? Uh, but it's, it's not having sex outside of marriage, it is having indiscriminate sex outside of marriage, okay? Same thing with whoremongering. The Word of God talks about and condemns whoremongering. What is whoremongering? Running around, having sex with every female that comes along, or everybody, the same thing could apply to a gay male or a lesbian woman, going around having sex with everything that comes along. That is not acceptable. Uh, that's not the way we're supposed to live our lives. Uh, however, there's a world of difference between a couple, for instance, that is in, and I was actually researching recently, and I was looking again at some of the Jewish uh, thoughts concerning a lot of this, and the Jewish uh, some of the articles I was looking at, they were talking about the fact that um, the notion of uh, premarital sex as it is presented today, you know, uh, it, it, it's, oh my God, it's such a major taboo, and bless God, even if you're engaged to be married, if you haven't put a ring on it yet, you know, you don't you dare do thus and so. 
And they said nowhere within the confines of the law is that the position that was taken. Well, how could it be? You go in the Bible and you show me people love to act like marriage is some divinely ordained, you know, um, thing. Not, not just marriage, but, but the whole idea of a wedding marriage, you know. Somehow or another, you know, uh, a marriage is only legitimate if you've gone through the church. Well, first of all, that's Roman Catholic doctrine that Protestants have embraced and run with. Roman Catholics turn marriage into a sacrament, and guess what? Protestant churches treat it as though it's a sacrament as well. Oh, sexual conduct between any couple is not acceptable until after they've had a ceremony. Nowhere in the Word of God, nowhere in the Word of God will you ever read that. Because marriage was never approached in that way in ancient times. The reality is, in, in the ancient world, marriage was, frankly, a personal contract between parties. It was a personal agreement between two individuals. Now, because women were treated pretty much as chattel, you know, um, the, you had the whole concept of the dowry where a man would present a dowry to the woman's father, you know, in exchange for the girl, and then he would take her and bring her to live with him. They would consummate their, their uh, union intimately, sexually. Well, how in the world can you commit premarital sex? How? According to the Apostle Paul, he said, when, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing for clarity, he says, when you lay down with somebody, he said, you're joining yourself to them. You're marrying them. So how, how, where's premarital sex? How do you commit premarital sex? No, marriage is sex. Sex is, in effect, marriage. You literally are joining yourself to another person when you engage in sexual intimacy. You're becoming one. That's why the Word of God teaches and talks about you've got to be careful. You know, you go out with a whore or a prostitute and you lay down with her. You're marrying her. You're literally joining yourself to her. It's not a, it's, it's not a, there's no such thing in God's eyes when it comes to sex of a hit and run, so to speak. That's not how it works. This is why we ought to be discriminating. This is why the best course of action, I got booby laughing over here, the best course of action is to save yourself for marriage, okay? And I'm, I'm never going to say that that isn't the best course of action. I'm never, ever, ever going to say that that is not the healthiest and the most beneficial way to approach uh, sexual activity. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Young person, once you let the cat out of the bag, once you become um, sexually active, you... Are, it, it's like you're throwing open a garage door and you're going to lose a whole bunch of stuff and you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff come in at you that you may or may not be ready for because intimacy carries with it a lot of repercussions. Don't ever fool yourself. It is not strictly a physical thing. 
you get with somebody because you're all horn doggled up and you're just, you think you're ready for it. And then that person decides a week from now that they don't even want to know you and they're going to act like they've never even heard your name. And I'm going to tell you something, you're going to hurt like you've never hurt before in your life. Because you made yourself available to them in the most intimate possible way. And there, everybody approaches intimacy with a different mindset and with different understanding. And this is why, you know, saving yourself for marriage. Now, here I am sounding very mainstream at the moment. But I told you, you know, people think because I say a certain thing a certain way, I mentioned a Sunday or two ago, they run out the door thinking they know everything we teach, and they don't know everything we teach. No, you can say something, and it does contradict your asinine way of looking at things, but by the same token, that by no means means that I'm standing here saying, yeah, you know, bless God's okay with you're just going out and whoring it up and screwing everything that comes down the road and blah, blah, blah. No, I'm never going to say that. Never, never, never. And do I recommend, whether you're straight or gay, do I recommend keeping yourself? And the best thing in the world you ever do is commit yourself for life to the person that you wind up being intimate with for the first time. And I'll tell you why that is such a good thing and such a positive thing. Um, because coming into it with that commitment first and that dedication uh, is going to help prevent an awful lot of negativity from coming down your way. Anybody, I've been there, I hate to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. When I came out, I thought I was going to hell in a handbasket, and God hated me. The church certainly hated me. So I thought, you know, it didn't matter what it did or how it did it. I initially came out, all I wanted was one person. That's all I ever wanted. Man, like a big dingus, I bought into everybody that paid me a compliment. I was very naive. I'd grown up in the church. I'd never been in the world. I'd never been to nightclubs or bars or, you know. I had no idea that there were so many predator, predatory people out there. But I found out, man, I wound up being used and wound up being mistreated and wound up, you know, having people hurt me over and over, and then you become jaded, then you become angry, then you become frustrated. Believe me, folks, I know what I'm talking about. So by no means am I suggesting that it is wise or healthy or good or godly for someone to just be out there uh, playing the field. But at the same time, there's another little phrase I've used for many years, and that phrase is this. Many people do many different things for many different reasons. And while it's easy to condemn wholesale certain behaviors or certain conduct, the reality is not everybody who does this certain thing is doing it for the same reason. You can stand there, preacher, and try to preach people into hell who engage in premarital sex because, after all, uh, they're just being, you know, they're allowing lust to dictate in their lives. Got news for you. There are many people out there, and that is not at all what motivates them. They may have been sexually abused as a young person, and they've literally come to identify intimacy as love. That is a very real situation. That is a very, it's a, that's a reality in the world in which we live. And 
when you are a child and someone victimizes you, it creates this notion in one's mind that if they love me, they're going to have intimacy with me. And so there are people out there who are doing all kinds of things that are not healthy, that are not good for them, that are not that don't fall within the definition of godly conduct. However, they're not all doing it for the same reasons. Okay, and it's ignorance on the part of Christians who constantly try to define everyone and everything in one specific way. We got to put everybody in one box. We've got to always, you know, to find everybody who does this is doing it for this one reason. And, and that's where you lose your credibility because the people who are out there who are not doing it for that reason, you can preach at them all day and all night that that's why they're doing it and they know better. It's like when I came out in 89, I remember, you know, hearing all this garbage preached about gay people, you know, they're child molesters, they're perverts, and blah, blah, blah. And it took me years to overcome that foolishness because I knew better. I'm like, I'm not a child molester. I'm not, I'm not even remotely interested in children. I'm not remotely interested in converting a straight person to homosexuality. I'm not even remotely interested in half the garbage that they're saying gay people are. I had a former friend in ministry, a preacher, he and his wife sent me a nasty letter when I accidentally came out to them. Uh, I won't go into the details of how that happened, but I accidentally uh, sent them a mailing that uh, exposed them to the fact that I had come out. And anyway, um, they wrote me a letter just calling me every name under the sign. I'm a child molester, I'm a pervert, I'm this, I'm that. And God news for you, that's a pile of malarkey, and I know it is. And when you stand there and you preach this kind of garbage at people, and they know good and bloody well that you're wrong, you lose credibility. You, you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. But I'm going to tell you what happens. Those people will never listen to three more words that come out of your mouth about anything because you've lost credibility with them. And this is one of the things the church has done over the centuries. They've lost credibility because they preach these narrow views, these idiotic notions they put everybody in one box, and the people who are living the experience know better. And therefore, the preacher just loses credibility. Nobody wants to listen to him. Now, I want to finish up real quick. We're talking about Ruth and Naomi. Pastor, why are you using them as an example of a same-sex relationship? I'll tell you why. Because the issue is commitment and love one for another. There are people in our world today who want to try to tell you that two women or two men cannot have that level of love one for another. They can't possibly. You can't possibly have. The kind of love for another man that I have for my wife or that I have, the woman says, that I have for my husband. You can't possibly. I remember an episode of All in the Family. Edith had a cousin who passed away. And when Archie and she went to the funeral, and, uh, they learned that she was a lesbian and that she had been with this same woman for 20-something years, and the lady she lived with, they thought they were just spinsters and living together, you know, and Edith learned that this, that they had been a couple and all, and then she tries to explain to Archie that they had more of a relationship than, um, than you might realize, you know, and he says something, you know, he's not quite understanding what she's saying. 
And then she says, well, you know, it's like I'm your wife and you're my husband. And, of course, Archie goes off, you know, well, they couldn't possibly have that kind of a relationship. Why couldn't they? Ruth loved her mother-in-law so much that she could not see her life without her mother-in-law in it. And she made a vow. She made a commitment to that woman. Now remember, remember, having a husband at this time in history was such a, of such huge importance. All the speech, the soliloquy that Naomi used on Ruth had to deal with, no, for God's sakes, you're young, go find a husband, you know, build your lives, blah, blah, blah. So having a man, quote-unquote, was of the utmost importance at that time in history. You could starve to death, literally. You could live in poverty for all of your life, not having a husband, not having sons to support you or family to support you. And here Ruth looks at Naomi and says, No, we're going to sink or swim together, honey. I'm not leaving you. Don't ask me to leave you. I'm not leaving you till I die. It was, in effect, a marriage vow. It, all the elements of marital vows is found in what Ruth had to say to Naomi. I'm not getting caught up in the, the foolishness of intimacy and sexuality because there are couples every day, straight and gay, that get married for any number of reasons. And whether or not they ever engage in intimacy and what kind of intimacy they engage in. For all I know, they lay down in bed together and shake hands. I don't know. I don't care. It's not my business. It's not my business when I perform a wedding for a man and a woman. It's not my business to worry about whether or not they ever engage in any kind of sexuality, you know, at all. I have a great aunt and uncle that married back during World War II. My... Uh, aunt wound up bearing my uncle, I want to say, I think it was either four or five kids. And after their last child was born, I kid you not, God is my witness. I learned this, you know, through my grandmother. Couldn't believe what I was hearing at the time. My aunt got her own bedroom. My uncle had his own bedroom. And they lived out the entire remainder of their marriage without any sex. They were married when he died. They were married 60 years. They engaged in intimacy for the first maybe 10 years. After that, never again. That's just the way they approached it. That's the way they did it. I, I know in my own family, I won't say exactly who, but I have a family member uh, that told me herself. Well, I guess my state, it doesn't matter, she's dead anyway. My grandmother told me years ago, she said, uh, your grandfather and I haven't been intimate in 30 years. You know, folks, why in the universe, when the law demands that if, if, if charges are to be brought, there are specific requirements for bringing and applying those, those laws. If that be the case, why in the name of God does anybody feel justified poking their nose into others' private affairs? 
how in the universe? But you know, fundamentalists and evangelicals, I didn't recognize this when I was, you know, up to my neck in the movement growing up. But I realized that after I come out, they don't have any understanding of boundaries at all. They think they can just jump into everybody else's business at will. Just, hey, if I want to get into your business, I'll get in on your business. Sorry, from a biblical perspective, that is entirely wrong. The Word of God, New Testament, tells us that we are not to be about other people's affairs. We're not supposed to be involved in other people's business and other people's conduct. That's contrary to Christian living. But like I said, fundamentalism would collapse on itself if it weren't for hypocrisy, okay? So the point I'm making is the Word of God gives us an example of a love and a level of commitment between two people of the same gender who made sacrifices in order to, to be together and stay together that illustrates that absolutely two people of the same gender, there's no question. And next week, because I'm out of time now, next week we're going to go into um, David and Jonathan, and we have the same exact uh, scenario with David and Jonathan. I don't speak where the Bible does not speak. I do not believe in uh, adding to or taking away from Scripture. So I do not make a case uh, for them being sexually involved with one another. It's possible, you know, there's uh, some who say there's, you know, certain evidence of that. Uh, I don't care, you know, again, because it's not about sex. That's not the issue. The issue is, can two people of the same gender genuinely love one another and make a till death do us part commitment to one another? And the biblical answer is absolutely. Absolutely. We have Ruth and Naomi demonstrating on the ladies' side. We have David and Jonathan demonstrating on the men's side. And we're going to look at that next week because there's a lot more to the story of David and Jonathan that we'll want to look at as well. And then also we're going to look at the story of uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And when the children of Israel were taken into captivity and he did not want to violate the dietary law. And uh, because as I've said, to break one of the laws is to be guilty of all of them. And while people want to act like, you know, the dietary laws weren't as important as other laws, if that were the case, then why didn't Daniel just have himself a cheeseburger and call it a day? Because that is not how it works. But Daniel uh, had a prince of the eunuchs who the Word of God said that uh, he was caused to have a tender love for Daniel. So he risked his own life to accommodate Daniel so that he could follow the dietary law. Uh, and, and he risked his own life because if the king found out, you know, it could have cost that prince of the eunuchs his life. And so, uh, but there was something special. There was a special um, feeling. There was a special love. We know that many eunuchs, uh, in fact, were homosexual, to be quite frank. And I, again, I'm running out, I'm out of time, so I really can't go into it. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about it next week, okay? All right, folks, I hope that this portion of uh, our look at same-gender relationships in Scripture has been, I'm biting my tongue again, I don't know what on earth I'm doing. I hope this has been uh, beneficial to you. I hope you've heard something tonight that's been a blessing or has helped you in some way. 
And uh, if we'll just close with a word of prayer. Master, once again, God, we come before the throne of grace, grateful for the plan of salvation, grateful, Lord, for the lengths to which our God, our Creator, has gone in order to bring us salvation. Master, tonight, oh God, I ask that uh, that which we have discussed tonight, Lord, please let it find its way into the deepest part of our heart. Lord, we do not advocate living lawlessly or living uh, immorally or ungodly, but by the same token, we do not believe, Lord, in uh, preaching and teaching something simply because it is a traditional viewpoint. If it is not, in fact, in keeping with the Word of God, then, Lord, we wish to discard it so that we might understand the full truth, the whole truth. Master, today, help us, Lord, to live our lives uh, in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. Help us, Master, today to do the best we can do to show our gratitude and our appreciation for your grace, which has brought salvation through faith to lost humanity. Go with us from this place, O God, and as I always request, keep us in your care. The world in which we live is dangerous. So much is happening, disease, sickness, violence. Keep a hedge of protection around your people, O God, and bring us back together at the next appointed time. We ask all this tonight and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I hope you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we meet Sundays at 3 uh, at um, Century Office Center, 3322. Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537, that is in Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. We would love to have you come worship with us and serve the Lord with us. I'm, uh, I don't know about you, but I love to worship alongside of people that love the Lord as much as I do. And then, of course, next Wednesday night at 7, we'll continue this Bible study on LGBT affirming theology, and I hope you'll join us for that as well. Until we meet again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.